Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're gonna to be talking about the connection, if there is any, between the use of level thyroxine and your risk of cancer. Now this might seem like a funny thing to be talking about. Why would I be interested in talking about the connection between level thyroxine and cancer? Well, there was a study that came out in 2021, so fairly recently, that included a large number of thyroid patients, about 600,000 patients, and showed that these thyroid patients who were taking level thyroxine had about a 50% increased risk of developing cancer at any site. Now, this is pretty concerning information. I wouldn't say it's alarming quite yet, which is why we're talking about it, right? I'm not trying to spread fear or cause fear in any single person. We just need to talk about the information that is in front of us. Now, my personal opinion on this is that we probably don't need to worry yet, and I'll be talking about it right now and throughout this video. Uh, but if you are somebody taking level thyroxine or any other thyroid medication for that matter, then hopefully you find this information helpful. So what I will do is I'll include the link to the study that I'm gonna be referencing below. And really what we're gonna be doing today is critiquing that study, talking about why I don't think you need to be freaking out if you are a thyroid patient taking level thyroxine, but we do need to kind of talk about the results of this study and, and what it means for you. We'll also be talking about some takeaways and so on. So let's talk about the study. Again, the link will be in the description below. Now, this was a retrospective study, and it was done in the country of Taiwan, which will be important as we go later on. And this study surveyed about uh, 600,000 thyroid patients. Now, in Taiwan, they have this database of information. It just includes a ton of health information of, of patients, not just thyroid patients, of a lot of different people, millions and millions of people. But what it allows researchers to do is it allows researchers to take certain criteria and look at that information backward in time and follow these patients and see, well, does they can ask questions, right? They can, they can probe the data for, for answers to questions that they may have. So they might say, hey, do patients taking level thyroxine increase, have an increased risk of developing cancer over some period of time? Now that's just the question they asked for this study, but they could have asked another question. They could have said, hey, do women who are age 45 who drink alcohol have a risk of, have an increased risk of developing breast cancer, right? They can look backwards in time at this data and really probe it for whatever they want to learn. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't guarantee the connection between these two things, which we'll talk about in the future, but it does send a signal that maybe there's something there, which means that we should probably look into this a little deeper. So when these researchers looked backward in time, they looked at these 600,000 thyroid patients, and I believe it was about two or three million um, control patients of healthy patients. You, you'll have to look in the, the data to confirm that value. So they look at thyroid patients and healthy com, um, control patients. They found that thyroid patients taking level thyroxine had higher risk of developing four specific types of cancer, including uh, brain cancer, skin cancer, pancreatic, and breast cancer. They also found that thyroid patients using level thyroxine had a lower risk of developing esophageal and cervical cancer. And when you put all this data together, it showed that about that thyroid patients taking level thyroxine had about a 50% increased risk of developing cancer at any site. You know, when you, when you account the much higher risk and the much lower risk, that was sort of the average together. So again, what, that's just the data, that's just the information. Um, and now what I wanna do is really critique that information. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about why I don't think you need to worry just yet. And I'll explain um, sort of my logic here and what, how I'm looking at this data and how I'm interpreting it as we go. So number one, the first thing we need to talk about is the fact that this is what's called a retrospective study. Now I won't bore you with the details of talking about all the different ways that researchers can look and the different ways that they can create uh, studies and research groups and groups of people and so on to follow them. But what I will say is that retrospective studies, they can be helpful, but they don't really show or prove anything when you, when you use them. And the reason is, well, there's several reasons for this, but one of the big reasons is that they're looking backwards in time at data that has already been collected and already existed. So this leaves a lot of potential problems. Now, one of these problems includes the problem of data keeping and laboratory testing. So when these patients are, are first going in and they're going to their doctor and they're just having their data collected, they're not necessarily collecting it for any particular reason. They're just saying, here, come in, get your yearly physical, let's, let's take a list of the medications you're taking and let's get your regular blood, blood work and then we'll just hold this data and then researchers can look at it in the future. But in the case of thyroid cancer and, and, or level thyroxine and the potential increased risk of cancer, we need to know more than just the regular stuff that they're testing for, right? We need to know a lot about their thyroid lab tests. We need to know about their personal history. We need to know a lot of these things. And so unfortunately, because that wasn't top of their mind when they were collecting this data, we don't have a lot of good information that we would like to see in order to say that level thyroxine causes the cancer. Right now, all we know is there's some connection. We don't know if it's causal or if it's just correlated, right? And that's a big deal. So the, the issue of data keeping and laboratory testing is important here. Number two, we also don't account for confounding variables. So what do I mean by that? 
Now imagine if we were looking at this group of people, thyroid patients, and we were trying to say that level thyroxine caused cancer in these patients. Well, in order to do that, we would have to rule out other things that could also cause cancer, right? And one big one would be something like weight gain, right? We know that people who tend to be overweight, which by the way, a lot of thyroid patients suffer from this problem, they have an increased risk of developing cancer because they are overweight, not because of their thyroid, but because of they are overweight. So that's a confounding variable, right? In other words, it skews the data. It makes it harder to tell which is actually causing the problem. Is it the weight gain? Is it the level thyroxine? Is it the thyroid? Right? It confounds the, the picture. It makes it a little more difficult. Now, in this study, we know that there were several factors not taken into account. And I included one of those already. One of them was BMI, which is important. Another one that they couldn't really account for was family history of cancer. Now, when you, when you do studies like this, you want to rule out those people who have a, high, who have a high, higher risk than the average population of developing cancer because they can skew the results. If you're looking at a bunch of people who, who um, happen to already know that they're probably going to develop cancer because they have a long family history of it, well, that's not a regular control that you can use. Another thing that they really didn't take into account was smoking history and then alcohol consumption as well, which again, both of these things can impact your risk of developing cancer. So these confounding variables are important insofar as they kind of muddy the water a little bit. Number three, we have the data source. Now, the data source obviously came from Taiwan, and which is another country. And the reason that this is important is because people in different geographical locations across the globe have different risks of cancer based off where they live. The environmental factors that they're surrounding, the, the type of water, you know, whether that water is contaminated with certain minerals or heavy metals or whatever it is. All of these things impact your risk or the people who are living there, their risk of developing cancer. So you can't really take information from, the, from Taiwan and apply it broadly to people who, who, let's say, live in the UK or to America, as the case may be. So that issue of the, the people that it was studying and testing for may not translate directly to other populations. So that, again, is another thing to, take, to keep in mind. And then lastly, and very, this is probably perhaps the most important thing, we don't have a lot of information on these patients on their dose of level thyroxine. So if you were going to blame level thyroxine on causing cancer, you would need to see how each patient was taking it. Because here, let me give you an example. Let's imagine that all these patients were taking level thyroxine, but the standard by which they were dosed is completely separate there than it was in the United States. So let's say, let's say on average, I'm just making this up, but let's say they were 20% underdosed in Taiwan compared to what the standard of care is here in America. That would make a big deal, right? That would make a big difference because it's not the medication so much as, as it is the dose. And that's really, really important here. So we don't have that information. We don't know how much they were taking and we don't know how that dose impacted their TSH, their free T3, their free T4, all of these important thyroid hormone lab tests. All we know is that these patients were taking level thyroxine for some period of time and they were allowed to be included into the study because they met the inclusion criteria. So that's the problem with the retrospective study. It doesn't, doesn't say anything about, it doesn't prove causation, it just proves some correlation. We don't know what that correlation is. So what that leads us to number two is that more research is definitely still needed. Now, I don't think that we need to freak out yet. This is part of the reason why, we, why I, I wanna say this as well. It's not quite time to freak out yet, but it, it, it is concerning. This information that we're, we're seeing here, the research is a little bit concerning, especially to thyroid patients. So don't be surprised in the coming years if we start to see more research related to level of thyroxine use and your personal risk of, of developing cancer. We're probably gonna see a lot of that coming out and it makes sense we would need to see that before we can definitively say, yes, it does or no, it doesn't. Number three, we don't have data on other thyroid medications. So don't freak out just yet because we don't know does this only apply to level thyroxine? Does it apply to natural desiccated thyroid? Does it apply to all thyroid medications? In other words, is it related to the thyroid, the medicine, or some other factor, right? So that's another reason why we don't have to worry just yet. Now, I will say the fact that we don't have information on these other medications um, is actually pretty good. We'll be talking about that in the takeaway section, section in just a minute here. And then number four, the last reason we don't need to worry just yet is because level thyroxine is bioidentical. So another word for that is body identical. And that just means that level thyroxine, even though it is synthetic, it contains the exact same hormones that your body would produce naturally. Now this is important because most of the time when we think about hormones and their impact on your personal cancer risk, a lot of the times that these hormones cause problems would be because they are, they are non-bioidentical. In other words, they are, uh, we call them, I call them Frankenstein-like hormones. They look similar to the hormones that your body produces, but they're not the exact same. So birth control pills would fall into this category. They target estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, but they are not the same estrogen and progesterone that your body produces naturally. 
And they do have an increased risk of cancer, by the way, if you look at the studies associated with birth control pills. Now, typically, hormones that are bioidentical, which means they are body identical, your body is used to producing these naturally, they typically do not cause the same problems that these Frankenstein-like uh, hormones do cause. Now, having said that, you can still take too much of a good thing and it ca can cause problems. So for instance, one good example of this would be the connection between using high doses of estrogen and your risk of uterine cancer or breast cancer. So there is a connection between the two if you use excessively high doses, which again leads me to believe that this connection between level thyroxine and the supposed cancer risk is likely more due to the dose and how it's being dosed than it is the actual medication itself. So let's talk about some takeaways. So what does this mean for you going forward? What should you do? How should you respond to this? How should you react and so on? So number one, I think this really, this is probably the most important thing. And that is don't take thyroid medication unless you absolutely need to be on it. Now you might say I was put on thyroid medication. I was told I have to be on it for life. And that's that. That's sort of true. Okay. So I have some, there's been some studies that have come out more recently that show that about 30% of thyroid patients may not need to be on thyroid medication forever. So it's a pretty, that's a pretty good chance, 30%. Um, so what I would recommend is if you don't have, uh, if you no longer have a thyroid and if your thyroid has been ablated or you are an end-stage Hashimoto's, then you're gonna have to take thyroid medication forever. But if you don't fit into those three categories, it may be worth exploring whether or not you need to be on thyroid medication forever, right? You, and I have resources that can help you with that. I have videos that go over that. So I'd recommend if this is, you know, a little bit concerning to you if you're hearing this, even though it's in its infancy, I don't necessarily think you need to freak out yet. But if you find yourself concerned, that would be, that would be okay. You might want to consider this option. Consider looking into whether or not you have to be on thyroid medication because 30% is a pretty, pretty big number uh, as far as people go, right? It's about one in three or pretty close to it. So don't take it unless you absolutely have to. Number two, another consequence of this is that it's probably going to be more difficult to get on thyroid medication from here on out. Now, doctors already made it kind of difficult to prescribe thyroid medication because uh, a lot of patients who felt that they were hyperthyroid, were hypothyroid, were actually in a subclinical hypothyroid state. So they weren't truly hypothyroid. Now, a lot of doctors could sort of be pressured into giving you thyroid medication in these instances. Now, I think that that's probably going to become less likely because if you are a doctor and you're seeing this information, you're gonna be like, well, if you don't really need it, I'm not going to prescribe it because if there's even a little bit of risk of developing cancer, even though, again, it's probably not quite that simple, that they could use that as ammunition to then say, let's not give it out to you. Now, this probably won't impact most of you watching this because most of you are probably taking it already because you really do need it, but there will be some people who are kind of on the cusp, especially in the case of, let's say, early Hashimoto's, who could maybe strong on their doctor into giving them medication early, and that does, can have a positive effect on, on certain patients with Hashimoto's. And as a result of this study, that may no longer be the case. So we'll have to see kind of how that plays out, but I'm guessing that it's probably not gonna be as easy as this information gets disseminated out. Number three, this is another big takeaway, and that is optimizing your dose of thyroid medication is more important than ever, and it's more important than whatever thyroid medication you're taking. So if you're listening to this and you're freaking out because you're thinking, well, I'm on level thyroxine and I have to be on level thyroxine. So if that's the case, don't freak out too much because you still have control over your dose. Now, remember, one of the most important things that this study did not take into account was the impact of that dose on thyroid function. So what I would say to you, if you're, if you're a little bit worried, is focus more on the dose that you're taking and less on that medication. So if you're taking level thyroxine, maybe you need more, maybe you need to, uh, maybe you need a little less, but focus on how that level thyroxine is impacting your TSH, your free T3, your free T4, and your reverse T3. As you optimize for those, those values, those uh, free thyroid hormone values, I think you'll have feel, not only feel better, but I also think you'll reduce any risk that may be associated with underdosing, which is probably what's happening underlying here. Number four, even if, again, you are a little bit upset about this uh, um, or freaked out or a little bit scared, there are still things that you can do to reduce your own risk, of, your own personal risk of cancer. So things like making sure that you are eating healthy foods, right? There's, it's never a bad idea to go on a whole food diet, which is what I'm constantly recommending thyroid patients to do. It's never a, a bad idea to make sure you're lowering your stress, to sleeping enough, to eating healthy, um, to doing all these things that can normalize your body weight, which will you know, balance your hormones, reduce insulin resistance, reduce leptin resistance, make your thyroid medication more effective. All of these things can be done and they should be done by you right now, regardless of whether or not you're hearing this. But let's say you have been holding off on doing this for some reason. Well, now maybe is the time to start doing these things. So now more than ever, I would say, make sure you focus on the things that are within your control so that these things, because these things can have an impact and will have an impact um, on your potential future cancer risk. And then number five, 
this has already happened, so I know that this has definitely happened to at least one person, but some person who read the article I wrote on this, which by the way, if you want a more in-depth um, sort of overview of this uh, study, I've written about it as well on my blog, so you can check that out. And one of the, one of the people on that blog left a comment and said that as a result of this, she, she basically requested that she get switched from level thyroxine to another thyroid medication. So that may be a positive as a result of this study. So you might be able to use this study as ammunition, so to speak, to help your doctor, or not help, but basically to say, hey, I don't feel comfortable taking level thyroxine because of this study. Do you mind giving me level thyroid, or do you mind giving me armor thyroid or NP thyroid or some other combination of thyroid medication? So that might be a good thing that comes with this study because most thyroid patients feel better when taking NDT thyroid medications or combination T4 and T3 thyroid medications. So that might be worth a shot as well if you're feeling a little bit, um, you know, if you're just feeling a little bit worried as a result of this information. But I do want to reiterate, I don't think it's time to, to worry just yet. Yes, this is concerning, uh, but no, it's not freak out time or anything like that for all the reasons that I've stated previously. Now, if you have any questions about this study, um, again, you can find the full link to the study uh, in the description below. And I have also a more detailed um, uh, write-up of the study and the critique of all the things that are going on. And I go into a little more detail there. This is just really an overview of that. So make sure you check that out if you have any questions. But if you do, you can also leave them below. Um, and if you haven't already, make sure that you download my free thyroid PDF resources. I have tons of information all designed to help thyroid patients like you feel better. So make sure you check those out as well if you haven't. And otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one.